In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins to God our Father, asking him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this I deserve your punishment, both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins, and trusting in my Savior Jesus Christ, I pray, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. You were sent to heal the contrite. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Christ Jesus, you came to call sinners. Christ, have mercy. God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us and has given his only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In the peace of forgiveness, let us praise the Lord. Gloria, Gloria, glory to God in the highest. Gloria, Gloria, and peace to his people on earth. Gloria, Gloria, glory to God in the highest. Gloria, Gloria, and peace to his people on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, almighty God and Father, we worship you. Lord, we pray that your mercy and grace may always go before and follow after us, that loving you with undivided hearts, we may be ready for every good and useful work. Through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, 
who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. Jeremiah was the only prophet in Jerusalem who was truly saying, this is what the Lord says. We see the opposition to him that, res that resulted. We see God's care for him in the midst of the opposition. Jeremiah chapter 38. Shephatiah son of Matan, Gedaliah son of Pasher, Jehuchal son of Shelemiah, and Pasher son of Melchijah heard what Jeremiah was telling all the people when he said, this is what the Lord says. Whoever stays in this city will die by the sword, famine, or plague, but whoever goes over to the Babylonians will live. He will escape with his life. He will live. And this is what the Lord says. This city will certainly be handed over to the army of the king of Babylon, who will capture it. Then the official said to the king, This man should be put to death. He is discouraging the soldiers who are left in this city, as well as all the people, by the things he is saying to them. This man is not seeking the good of these people, but their ruin. He is in your hands, King Zedekiah answered. The king can do nothing to oppose you. So they took Jeremiah and put him in the cistern of Melchijah, the king's son, which was in the courtyard of the guard. They lowered Jeremiah by ropes into the cistern. It had no water in it, only mud, and Jeremiah sank down into the mud. But ebed melech a Cushite, an official in the royal palace, heard that they had put Jeremiah into the cistern. While the king was sitting in the Benjamin gate, ebed melech went out of the palace and said to him, My lord the king, these men have acted wickedly in all they have done to Jeremiah the prophet. They have thrown him into a cistern where he will starve to death when there is no longer any bread in the city. Then the king commanded ebed melech the Cushite, Take thirty men from here with you and lift Jeremiah the prophet out of the cistern before he dies. So Abedmelech took the men with him and went to a room under the treasury in the palace. They took some old rags and worn out clothes from there and let them down with ropes to Jeremiah in the cistern. Abedmelech the Cushite said to Jeremiah, Put these old rags and worn out clothes under your arms to pad the ropes. Jeremiah did so, and they pulled him up with the ropes and lifted him out of the cistern. And Jeremiah remained in the courtyard of the guard. This is God's word. We'll continue with psalm of the, the psalm of the day, Psalm 3. After the introduction, the congregation is invited to sing the refrain, again as it occurs throughout the psalm, and to join in singing the glory be to the Father. up against me. Many are saying of me, God will not deliver him. But you are a shield around me, O Lord. You bestow glory on me and lift up my head. To the Lord I cry aloud, and he answers me from his holy hill. From the Lord comes deliverance, therefore we will not fear. I lie down and sleep, I wake again because the Lord sustains me. I will not fear the tens of thousands drawn up against me on every side. Arise, O Lord, deliver me, O my God. From the Lord comes deliverance. May your blessing be on your people. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, 
as it was in the beginning, is now and will be forever. Amen. From the Lord comes deliverance, therefore we will not fear. The longer Peter followed Jesus and the more he grew, the more he understood that unique suffering that comes from suffering, it's from following Jesus. Second, first Peter chapter 4. Dear friends, do not be surprised at the painful trial you are suffering, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice that you participate in the sufferings of Christ, so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed, for the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. If you suffer, it should not be as a murderer or thief or any other kind of criminal or even as a meddler. However, if you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed, but praise God that you bear that name. For it is time for judgment to begin with the family of God. And if it begins with us, what will the, what will the outcome be for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if it is hard for the righteous to be saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? So then, those who suffer according to God's will should commit themselves to their faithful creator and continue to do good. This is God's word. We continue with the verse of the day. Please stand for the gospel. The holy gospel will also serve as the basis of today's sermon. Mark chapter 8. Jesus and his disciples went on to the villages around Caesarea Philippi. On the way, he asked them, Who do people say I am? They replied, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. But what about you? he asked. Who do you say I am? Peter answered, You are the Christ. Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about him. He then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me and for the gospel will save it. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise be to you, O Christ. Let's join together to confess our faith with the words of the Nicene Creed. 
We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated. We sing hymn 465.
Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Once more, Jesus' conversation with his disciples and the crowd in Mark chapter 8. Jesus and his disciples went on to the villages around Caesarea Philippi. On the way, he asked them, who do people say I am? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked, who do you say I am? Peter answered, you are the Christ. Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about him. He then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for me and for the gospel will save it. This is God's word. So here's my impression of Peter. Jesus, I believe in you. I I know that you're not just a great teacher and a faithful prophet. You are the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God, the only Savior. But Jesus, don't you dare mention suffering and dying. I will have none of it. Isn't that, isn't that kind of like saying, like, cookie dough ice cream is my favorite, but I can't stand all those chunks of cookie dough they put into it? I, I'm pretty sure that if you take out those chunks, you just call it vanilla. In the same way, if you take away Jesus' suffering, rejection, death, and resurrection, you don't have a Savior anymore. Without cookie dough chunks, there's no cookie dough ice cream. Without a cross, there's no Savior. What if at that moment, Jesus would have given Peter a tour of our church? There's there's a cross on the baptismal font, another one on the altar, another one beside the altar, the big bright window above the altar, crosses everywhere. If Peter could have seen our church, that this is what a Christian church looks like at that moment, I bet he would have thrown up in his mouth. He knew what crosses were for, and he had no interest in seeing Jesus on one. And and if you wonder, like, how could Peter possibly be so blind? Two things. First of all, at this moment, neither Jesus nor anyone else had taught the specifics that Jesus would die on a cross. This is the, this is the first time in Mark's gospel that Jesus even mentions a cross. And, and notice in verse 34, he's not talking about his cross, he's talking about theirs. It's, it's first now, halfway through Mark's gospel, that Jesus begins to speak plainly about his death to his disciples. So, so if we're wondering, how could Peter be so blind? Well, there's that. But, but if you're thinking, this still shouldn't have surprised Peter so much. There were all the Old Testament prophecies, like Isaiah chapter 53, he was pierced for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And then as, as Mark's gospel continues, well, by the time you get to, to chapter 14, by then Jesus had explained in detail again and again what was going to happen to him when he got to Jerusalem. And still, in Mark chapter 14, when they're in the Garden of Gethsemane and it's time to get the ball rolling and Judas betrays him, remember what Peter does? He pulls out his sword and he tries to stop it. So yeah, 
It is like Peter's blind. He doesn't understand the centrality of Jesus' cross. He, he knows that Jesus is the Christ, but he doesn't understand what that means. No cross, no Christ. There's more than one place in the gospel where it's, where it's easy for us to come down on Peter and the other disciples to. It's, they're kind of like low-hanging fruit when, when we want to feel better about our own faith. Well, at least I understand Jesus better than they did. But do you think that's why God tells us this? Or do you think God maybe is showing us, Peter, to give us insight into some of our own blind spots. Do we like the idea of a cross? A survey of the decor in our church and the words of our hymns and our jewelry? Well, I would say so. But do you think your perception might change? if you personally experienced the sights and smells and sounds of a crucifixion? Like these things didn't start out as church decorations. They would hang people from these. Dr death could drag out for days. And no doubt Peter had experienced that. Who is it besides Jesus? <laughs> that means more to you in the world than anyone else. If they told you that they had a plan where they were going to willingly suffer, be rejected, and killed, what would you think? And even though Jesus hasn't explicitly told them yet that he's going to die on a cross, he does give kind of a hint When he says that everyone who follows him must carry a cross, well, that kind of implies that the one in the lead is going to be doing the same thing. If the person who means more than anyone else in the world to you told you that, do you think you might object? Crosses are horrible. Let's, let's not lose sight of that when we see the ones that are all gilded in gold but this was a necessity for Jesus. From that point on, Jesus began to explain to them that the Son of Man must, must suffer many things. He must be killed. No cross, no Christ. And you notice there's another must in there? Did you catch the third one? If anyone would come after me, he must, must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. When Jesus talks about those who follow him, he's plain as plain can be. No cross, no Christ. Yeah, no cross, no Christian. What, what does that mean? It, it doesn't mean that that Jesus dies on, on his cross to pay for half of our sins and then we all need to die on a cross to pay for the other half. Here's the point. Jesus suffered in no small way to restore us to God. There was no other way to save. In the same way, we suffer as we follow him. There's no other way to follow it's not that we go, go, go looking for it. It's just what happens when you follow Jesus in a world of sin. And, and it's not like this kind of suffering is completely unavoidable. We can avoid it. It's just that the only way to do that is to stop following Jesus. Maybe it becomes clear if we look at this at work in, in real life. John the Baptist, he comes up in, in this reading. How about John the Baptist? 
John the Baptist followed Jesus. He, he prepared the way for the Lord. And, and when the, the crowds were flocking to him in the wilderness, he was up front with them that this isn't about me. This is about Jesus. Always saying, look, 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 the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And then he didn't shrink back from telling the king that, it, that he was sinning by taking his brother's wife to be his own wife. He, he didn't know that that was going to land him in a dungeon and get his head chopped off. But that's still what following Jesus got him. And, and that suffering that he endured, it, it wasn't just that which was inflicted by, by Herod, Languishing in his prison cell, there was a war going on in his own heart between doubt and faith. He, he sent messengers to Jesus to ask Jesus, are, are you the one who was to come or should we expect some, someone else? Because Jesus, this isn't what I was expecting. John the Baptist carried a cross. Elijah comes up in this, in this reading too. How about Elijah. Elijah followed Jesus before Jesus was born. He was a, a faithful spokesman for God at a time when virtually no one listened. And Elijah, he, he had some highs, but his lows were low. Like that, like that time that Queen Jezebel vowed to kill him and he ran for his life and he wound up in the desert and he collapsed underneath a tree and he prayed to God, just let me die because he was exhausted and discouraged and he just didn't have the strength to follow anymore. John the Baptist, Elijah, carried a cross. John the Baptist... Elijah, not to mention Jeremiah that we heard about in, today's, in the first lesson today, that the stories of their crosses might be more dramatic than most. But that following a Jesus, that being a Christian is, is hard, that's not the exception. That's a universal. If anyone would come after me, Jesus says. There's going to be a cross. It's going to be hard. And if you're thinking that, that you're just going to be the, you know, wear the, wear the Christian name tag, but only when, it's, only when it's convenient because you're really not all that much of a fanatic and, and following Jesus is more of a hobby for you, well, that, that little word must gets in the way. No cross, no Christ, no cross, no Christian. It's so much different from the way that Christianity is often portrayed. You know, like where... As long as you give yourself to God and believe with all of your heart and pray like you should, then everything will go your way. The picture that Jesus paints is a whole lot different. Suffering, self-denial, crosses. It doesn't sound like an effective way to build a following, does it? And you wonder, like, how many people have actually listened to that and, and actually taken it to heart and, and decided not to follow because Jesus wasn't worth it to them. They, they, they preferred to live for themselves and for this side of the grave. It doesn't sound like an effective way to build a following, but look at the kind of following that Jesus built. John the Baptist, he's rotting in a dungeon because of Jesus. To use Jesus' words, he, he loses his life for Jesus and the gospel. And it's hard. And there's a, and there's a war going, in, going on inside of his, his heart. But, but he doesn't go and try to strike a deal with Herod. Like, hey, Herod, um, I'll stop nagging you about your brother's wife if you let me out of this cage with my head on my body. 
he takes up his cross and he follows in the footsteps of Jesus. And, and Elijah on the run from Jezebel and Jeremiah starving in the cistern, these, these weren't emotionless robots or, or blocks of wood. It was really hard. There was opposition from the outside. There was turmoil on the inside. Horrible hardships that left them gasping for breath and praying for relief. And, and when we feel like John the Baptist and Elijah and Jeremiah, our stories may not be as dramatic as theirs, but if you've been a Christian for any amount of time, then you know the special hardships that come from following in the footsteps of Jesus, even if no one else can see them because the only place you feel them is in your heart. Doesn't God love me? Doesn't he care? I thought he was faithful. When we feel like John the Baptist and Elijah and Jeremiah, let me tell you what Jesus doesn't do. He doesn't put on his reading glasses and slowly page open his Bible to, to Mark chapter 8, verse 34, and look down his nose contemptuously at you and, and say, oh, didn't you read this? It's been, in, it's been in here the whole time. If anyone would come after me, he must. This is what you signed up for. Stop complaining. When you groan under the weight of your cross? What Jesus does is he points you to his cross, that horrible instrument of torture that is nevertheless glorious because Jesus, because Jesus took up his cross and died on it. This is what it means that Jesus is the Christ. That Jesus endured all of those horrible things and died for you. There's nothing left for you to do to earn God's love. Jesus tells you, I already earned it. There's nothing left for you to do to pay for any of your sins. Jesus says, I already paid it. I didn't just die on a cross, Jesus says. I died on a cross for you. And now, he gives us the honor of following in his footsteps, walking a righteous path through a world of, of, of evil, that doesn't come easy. Evil pushes against us from the outside. There's evil on the inside that pushes just as, as hard. But, but Jesus keeps on pointing us to his cross. You're not walking alone. I'm walking with you, and I know the way. With me, there's no better place to be all this, all this talk about, about following Jesus, the, it, it implies a destination. And when Jesus talks to his disciples about, about his journey, it's like they don't even notice the part about after three days rising again. And when we stumble under the weight of our own crosses, we might lose sight of that too, that this journey, it doesn't end in a grave. It ends in life and in heaven. When Jesus brings you home, there's not going to be any more evil pushing against you from the outside, rebelling against you from the inside. 
you'll still be you. Jesus will still be Jesus. But there will be no more struggle of any kind. For now, we'll still struggle against the blind spots. But there we'll see that when we follow Jesus, he was always with us. And we'll see that he really did use every ounce of hardship for good. For your own good. For somebody else's good. For a whole lot of people's good. That's what it means that Jesus is the Christ. That's what it means to follow him. Amen. Please stand. Now the peace of God which surpasses all understanding, guard your hearts and your minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. If you've brought an offering today, you may place it in the special offerings box at the entrance to the sanctuary. We will continue with the prayer of the church. Uh, two additions to our, to our prayers today. One is uh, David and Gay Ray. David had a, a heart scan um, this past Thursday, and it revealed major, major blockage in his heart. So he is scheduled to have surgery to have a stent uh, put in on Tuesday. Uh, and then also the Vukmer family, especially Brent Vukmer, who has been hospitalized with COVID. Lord Jesus, enlighten our eyes of faith so that we might always know the glory of following you. When we face hardship and uncertainty on account of your name, give us strength so that we do not shrink back in fear or seek the easy way out. Let our crosses draw us closer to your cross where you redeemed us and to our baptisms where you claimed us as your own. Let people see your power at work in our willingness to suffer hardship for your name. Use it all to the glory of your name and the salvation of people. We pray to you most earnestly today for the sake of the critically ill. Guard and keep David Ray while he waits for heart surgery this Tuesday. Grant that it goes smoothly and that he recovers quickly. Give David and Gay and everyone else who loves them the peace of your gracious presence. Guard and keep Brent Vukmer as he is treated for COVID in the hospital. Give his medications effectiveness. Give his doctors wisdom. Give him peace and rest. And we pray recovery. Give peace also to Cynthia, John, and Henry during this time when they cannot be at the side of their husband and father. But you are with them, and you are with Brent. We thank you for the progress you've allowed Julie Sherwin's mom, Beverly, to see after her stroke. Continue to pour out your faithful love on Dan Clark and Elizabeth Swoboda during their cancer treatment and for all in our congregation who are homebound. We pray for these and all things in your name, Lord Jesus, who with the Father and the Holy Spirit are living and ruling over all things now and forever. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, 
hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is good and right so to do. It is truly good and right that we should at all times and in all places give you thanks, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who promised that wherever two or three come together in his name, there he is with them to shepherd his flock till he comes again in glory. Therefore, with all the saints on earth and hosts of heaven, we praise your holy name and join their glorious song. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. Prince of peace, you take away the sins of the world. Communicant members of Living Hope and of the Wisconsin Synod are invited to come forward to the Lord's table at the direction of the elder.
Take and eat. This is the true body of our Lord Jesus Christ, given into death for your sin. Take and eat. This is the true body of our Lord Jesus Christ, given into death for your sin. Take and eat. This is the true body of our Lord Jesus Christ, given into death for your sin. Take and eat. This is the true body of our Lord Jesus Christ, given into death for your sin. Take and drink. This is the true blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, poured out for you for the forgiveness of all of your sins. Take and drink. This is the true blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, poured out for you for the forgiveness of all of your sins. Now may this true body and blood of our Lord Jesus strengthen and preserve you in the one true faith until life everlasting. Depart in peace. Amen. Take and eat. This is the true body of our Lord Jesus Christ, given into death for your sin. Take and eat. This is the true body of our Lord Jesus Christ, given into death for your sin. Take and eat. This is the true body of our Lord Jesus Christ, given into death for your sin. Take and eat. This is the true body of our Lord Jesus Christ, given into death for your sin. Take and drink. This is the true blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, poured out for you for the forgiveness of all of your sins. Take and drink. This is the true blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, poured out for you for the forgiveness of all of your sins. Now may this true body and blood of our Lord Jesus strengthen and preserve you in the one true faith until life everlasting. Depart in peace. Amen. Take and eat. This is the true body of our Lord Jesus Christ, given into death for your sin. Take and eat. This is the true body of our Lord Jesus Christ, given into death for your sin. Take and eat. This is the true body of our Lord Jesus Christ, given into death for your sin. Take and eat. This is the true body of our Lord Jesus Christ, given into death for your sin. Take and drink. This is the true blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, poured out for you for the forgiveness of all of your sins. Take and drink. This is the true blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, poured out for you for the forgiveness of all of your sins. Take and drink. This is the true blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, poured out for you for the forgiveness of all of your sins. 
Now may this true body and blood of our Lord Jesus strengthen and preserve you in the one true faith until life everlasting. Depart in peace. Amen. Take and eat. This is the true body of our Lord Jesus Christ, given into death for your sin. Take and eat. This is the true body of our Lord Jesus Christ, given into death for your sin. Take and drink. This is the true blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, poured out for you for the forgiveness of all of your sins. Now may this true body and blood of our Lord Jesus strengthen and preserve you in the one true faith until life everlasting. Depart in peace. Amen. Thanks, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us with this Holy Supper. We pray that through it you will strengthen our faith in you and increase our love for one another. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen.
again to God's house. It was wonderful to worship with all of you this morning. Um, I've been meaning to I've been meaning to make an oral announcement for uh, for a few weeks, and I, I keep on forgetting. So I wrote myself a note up here. Uh, uh, Avery Hayes is building, uh, rebuilding uh, the bulletin board of pictures of uh, friends and members of Living Hope uh, as a way for us to um, to get to know each other and, and be able to identify faces with names. Uh, so she is here, and I'm sure that she is um, that she's um, able and willing to take pictures right after church. I was going to tell you, and I'm going to be a leader by going first with my family because because I should practice what I preach and you can follow me. Um, so I may do that, but my wife is not here today. I don't know if she'd be upset. Um, so you can have my place in line and uh, my family will go next week. Um, Avery, is there like um, like an easy spot to find you or a place where they can just, people yeah, can come? Yeah, Avery will just be right out by the kitchen. Come okay, okay, wonderful, painless and, uh, and easy. Um, otherwise, I'd just direct your attention to the, the notes in the calendar, in the bulletin, um, especially on the calendar for this coming week. We have a outside work day next Saturday, there's some kind of party next Sunday. Uh, we'll have refreshments right now, and then at 10.30, we'll have Sunday school and Bible class. Uh, in Sunday school, um, the kids will be learning about uh, the fall into sin and the first promise of the Savior. I'm convinced that really to understand the narrative of Scripture, um, that those first three chapters of the Bible, they, they need to be the foundation. So a wonderful lesson for Sunday school today. And then in, in Bible class, we'll be looking at Deborah and Samson and some of Israel's uh, darker days. Um, I wish you God's blessings on your week. <laughs>